hello. Thanks for joining us again on Level Up. Today's video is all about the user interface and user experience design principles and practices that you can use to better communicate with your players and give them a consistent and polished experience in your game. Let's start off with user interface or UI design. UI is what you get when you combine artistic graphic design with communication-centric information design. Where game design is concerned with offering players interesting choices to make, UI design provides players with the information that they need in order to make those choices. Maybe they need to know how many hit points they have left in combat so they can decide whether to continue battle, use a healing potion, or run away. Or maybe they want to learn what benefits a particular upgrade will provide before they purchase it. If the UI is well-designed, that information is right there when they need it, easy to find and interpret. Players don't have to think too much about it. The UI feels like a seamless part of their experience. On the other hand, poorly designed UI actually makes it harder for players to make decisions and take actions in the game. They can't find the information they need when they need it, or it's hard to understand because the visual representation is unclear, which can be incredibly frustrating for players and actually discourage them from continuing to play. Regardless of how fun the gameplay may be, UI can make or break a game. User interface design is all about communicating with the player. And in any form of communication, it's important to prioritize the information that you share. This is especially true in games, where players have to make split-second decisions and maybe playing on a tiny mobile screen that doesn't have a lot of room for clutter. The highest priorities for game UI are the features that players will access the most often and the information that they need in order to make decisions in the moment. In the case of the survival game, that means things like the player's map and crafting tools as well as the indicators for their health and hunger status, the things that they need in order to keep surviving. Of course, the features and information that are most relevant can change moment to moment. Rather than filling up the whole screen with every possible button that the player could potentially need, Super Striker League here demonstrates contextual buttons that change from running and tackling abilities to dodging and passing abilities, depending on whether the player has control of the ball. In so doing, it eliminates clutter, the buttons that aren't relevant in context, and it reduces the choices on the screen that the player has to contend with by staying focused on what matters in the moment. Now let's say that you've ruthlessly decluttered your UI, you've prioritized what information is shown, and you're even swapping out elements contextually. That's awesome but players may still have trouble finding what they're looking for, especially if they are new to your game. But there are methods that you can use to get their attention and direct them where they need to go. One is the judicious use of color. Whatever you decide is the most important thing on the screen, the thing that you want players to pay the most attention to. Make that the brightest and most eye-catching thing they see. On this season past UI from Jailbreak, the first thing that I see is the row of rewards that are exclusive to the premium pass, thanks to that bright gold bar underneath their icons. Now, I don't think that's a coincidence. It's exactly what I would want players to focus on if I were trying to entice them to purchase that pass. Size can also influence what players pay attention to. Larger elements are perceived to be more important, so we notice them first. You can use that to your advantage when deciding what to give visual prominence to in your UI. In this example from Super Striker League's HUD, size and color are both used to direct players to the play button and to minimize the visibility of less important buttons like settings. Although there's still a lot going on here, new players shouldn't have much trouble figuring out how to start a match and get to the fun quickly. Space is also an important element of visual design that influences what we pay attention to. Elements that are off on their own, surrounded by empty space, are visually interesting and draw the eye. In Dragon Venture's shop, space, size, and color all come together to strongly suggest that players notice the largest and most valuable currency bundle. 
the best value banner doesn't hurt either. And that's a best practice for shop UI design, by the way. Finally, close proximity between elements implies a relationship. And that can be used to visually group things together to help players make sense of what they're looking at. In this example from Tower Defense Simulator, I know at a glance that the three items on the left are related to each other and are different from the cluster of items on the right because of how size and proximity are used to visually group them. Once you have players' attention and you've directed it where you want them to look, you can help them to understand what they're seeing by employing a deliberately designed and consistent visual language. Starting once again with color. The more colors you use in your UI, the more noisy and distracting it's going to be, and the harder it will be for players to know what to look at first. So limit your color palette to a handful of aesthetically pleasing colors that fit the theme and the tone of your game. And you can also assign meaning to colors. This is commonly seen on red close or cancel buttons and green OK or accept buttons. That's a convention that a lot of games follow, similar to red and green traffic lights, meaning stop and go. But you can convey more nuanced information as well through color. In Arcane Odyssey here, character stats have unique and distinct colors associated with them, and those associations are carried throughout the game's UI. For example, the vitality stat, which determines the character's maximum health, is depicted in green, and so is the character's health bar. That shared color helps players to mentally associate them, especially because it is reinforced by consistent application throughout the entire game. Icons and the elements that compose them can also have a consistent visual identity that communicates meaning and associations. In Winds of Fortune, icons that relate to a particular stat share not just a color, but also a pretty consistent shape language. That helps players to quickly learn each stat's meaning and its related effects in their character, as well as recognize and distinguish them from each other at a glance. Buttons are a very important part of UI. They're one of the most common forms of player input. So you wanna be sure that your buttons are recognizable as such, that your players know when they see one that they can interact with it. Putting a container around your buttons, a color surrounding the text or icon that sets it apart from the background goes a long way. And you can make it look even more touchable by adding a highlight to give the impression of 3D depth as Bot Clash did here. Once you've settled on a style, apply it consistently across all of your game's buttons. Now I mentioned earlier the color convention of red and green buttons. There are others as well, like the X symbol also meaning close. There may be more that are specific to the genre or the device that you're designing for. If you ignore those conventions, you risk potentially confusing players, and you're also choosing not to take advantage of the understanding and habits they've already developed from other games. So do your due diligence, be aware of any existing conventions around the game you're making, and make your choices with those considerations in mind. Text, font, and style can also be useful in prioritizing the player's attention. Headers and titles, which contain important high-level information, should be larger and bolder than body text where the details are conveyed. Choose fonts and colors that are highly legible and that contrast well against whatever background color they'll be displayed over. There are a lot of fun fonts out there that are hard to read, and it doesn't matter how well they match the theme of your game if they're illegible. Always keep in mind that the goal of UI is to communicate with the player, and ultimately that's more important than the aesthetics. But hopefully you can find a way to meet both goals. While UI is concerned with providing players with the information that they need in order to take actions in the game, UX is concerned with the actions themselves. How players interact with the game, making their choices known, and how they flow from one choice to the next. In this example from Barry Avenue RP, the UX designer decided that avatar customization should consist of a grid of items with tabs to sort them into categories and a search field so that players can look up items using keywords. Players navigate the grid by scrolling rather than perhaps tapping arrow buttons. 
when they select an item, it's added to an equipped items list on the left. And if they want to remove it, they can deselect it by tapping its icon in the grid again, or by tapping it in the equipped items list. All of this happens within the customization UI. But you notice I didn't mention color or text or what the icons look like, because those are all the visual wrapper around the experience. That's the UI. And that's the difference between UI and UX. The goal of the UX designer is to create interactions and flows that are intuitive, unobtrusive, and convenient for players to use. And you'll find that difficult if you don't understand who you're designing for. Demographics like age and gender can help to inform UX design choices. For example, very young players may have less developed manual dexterity than older players, so they struggle with interactions that require precision and quick reflexes. Players' level of general gaming experience, as well as familiarity with the specific genre that you're designing, is another key consideration. As you design your game, you make assumptions about the players that you are targeting, the ones that you want to play your game or think will be the most likely players to do so. Then there's gameplay style. Are you designing for players who are very social and like to collaborate? Or players who are highly competitive or who like to explore solo? Decide who your target audience is and then get to know them by meeting them, playing with them, and even seeing what you can find in terms of research online. All of those characteristics inform the mechanics that you choose to design for your game, but they can also inform the UX, like how those players will approach making choices and how you want them to feel as they do. Once you have a good idea of who your target audience is and which features they will be the most excited about, you can write user stories. These are walkthroughs of a hypothetical user engaging with a feature written in narrative form. The user story documents their goals, the actions that they take to accomplish them, and their thought process and emotions as they do so. Those user stories allow development teams to visualize the target audience, personified in a fictional player, as well as the designer's goals for how they will experience the feature. That understanding is invaluable for designing interactions that are intuitive and satisfying for your players. I've mentioned conventions before, but there are a number of interactions on Roblox that a veteran player will already be familiar with, like the E to interact prompt that appears when players are in proximity to an interactive object. Unless you have a compelling reason to do things differently, reinventing the wheel is probably unnecessary, and whatever you replace it with may not be as intuitive for players. For interactions and game mechanics that are less familiar, or that have no real life equivalent, like casting magic spells, try to find a metaphor that will help bridge the gap between what players are familiar with and the actions that they'll take in the game. Spellbound here makes the abstract concept of magic more concrete and intuitive by using the metaphor of a deck of cards from which players choose spells to cast. It's a pretty common games metaphor and an effective one. On the UI side, Cards are a convenient and familiar way to present information about each spell. And they've also cleverly used a clock-like spinning indicator to communicate turn order. When deciding how to present interactions to your players, check out other games in your genre and see what metaphors they use. Maybe they're exactly what you need, or perhaps you can improve upon them or come up with ones that are even better. Whatever you choose, it's a good idea to prototype it and test it out with players to make sure the metaphor that you pick is clear and helpful rather than confusing. In addition to designing intuitive interactions, UX designers are also concerned with how players navigate from one action or UI screen or choice to the next and making sure that those flows are logical and convenient. Flow diagrams are extremely useful in visualizing the steps required for players to accomplish a goal, like equipping an item on their avatar. This flowchart is a somewhat simplified representation of that experience in Barry Avenue, depicting the steps that the player goes through to navigate the customization UI and select an item. It's clear that the designer put a lot of thought into ease of use because they included convenient item sorting through body part tabs, a search option for players who know exactly what they're looking for already, and two intuitive ways to unequip an item. Now, 
why would they have two methods to accomplish the same thing? Well, maybe the designer always planned it that way, or maybe they observed players trying to unequip items using both methods during the play test, even if only one of them worked at the time. And then they added the second method based on those observations. With both methods functional, no matter which way players expect it to work, it does. That latter case, where players may have tried a logical method of unequipping that didn't work, is an example of a pain point, a source of what's called friction that causes players confusion or frustration or just unnecessary effort to accomplish a task. A common source of friction that I've observed in Roblox games is when there's an item that players purchase frequently, like consumable items that go away after use, and there's no convenient way to buy more than one in a single purchase. In fact, sometimes players have to sit through a lengthy animation or navigate from their inventory where the item was delivered all the way back to the shop in order to make another purchase. This is where really understanding how players use your game's features is helpful, whether it's through anticipating their needs with user stories or observing their behavior through play tests and analytics. Small adjustments to your UX can increase engagement and even monetization and lead to happier players. That's all for this video. I hope you found it helpful. Let us know in the comments if there are any other UI UX topics you'd like us to cover and if you plan to implement anything that you learned here in your game. Keep an eye out for more Level Up Game Development videos coming soon.